So we will welcome everybody back. I'm going to open us up in prayer again, and we will move into um, a, a, a really cool visual picture and understanding that once I was discipled in by the one who disciples me, the Lord began to enhance it, bring it to life, stretch it wider um, as I studied and pressed into the word, and it has changed my walk. Uh, and I pray it will do the same for you. So Heavenly Father, again, we just come into your presence. We can't pray enough. We can't praise you enough. We can't worship enough. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of it all, of our time, of our energy, of our resources, Father. I just pray now, even as I was speaking um, to, to an attendee here and you were drawing this to my mind, God, there is blessing we see in the scriptures. Lord, when people come, when they make effort, when the woman pushed through the crowd to grab of the hem of your garment. Lord, when the people drew their sick out even to fall into the shadow of Peter. There is blessing, there is anointing that is poured out when people put demand on it, you supply. When people make the effort, mileage, time, money, resources to to draw near to your heart, to receive of teaching, to be filled. God, there is just a principle in the spirit because you are good. You supply, you move, you reveal, you teach, you heal when people recognize that you can. And so they come. So Heavenly Father, I pray that you would do just that. Even in this next hour, Lord, you would make yourself known that as they put demand, Lord, you would supply and you would bless them. You would bless them even as a result of their efforts. You say hunger and thirst for righteousness and you will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. I just pray there is blessing that pours out in Jesus' name. Amen. So, As we were talking earlier, as I was testifying to you all earlier about my own story, it was powerful. Come grab seats, get yourself comfortable. It was powerful when I had the revelation of my redemption because of the encounter with Jesus. And then even without discipleship at the time, I just praise God for his faithfulness simply because the Holy Spirit had been welcomed to fill me. I had decided to follow. There was a boldness that came. There was a hunger and a thirst that came. And I began to realize that the result of a love so great, the result of a rescuing encounter, the result of the mercy of God fully warranted the complete and total yielding of my life. There was no sin the Lord could point out in me that I was, was too ashamed to say, you are literally right, God. Like sometimes <laughs> we just need to get really raw and honest with the Lord. We puff ourselves up with such pride. It's like lipstick on a pig in the slop. When we think, what does the word of God say? That let no man think better of himself than he is. Like in sober mind, assess your spiritual condition. Right? The word says to test ourselves to test ourselves, to ensure that we are in Christ. To take regular assessment. And, and by the grace of God, I just, there was nothing he could point out that I was like, that's not true. Notice the Samaritan woman didn't run off in shame. Oh, you say I've been married to five. No, 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 that's a different woman in town. I haven't had five husbands. You have the wrong person. No, she said, who are you that you would know everything about me? That's how I felt when I encountered the Lord because there were things I hadn't told anyone. There were things that were so secretive, such hidden sins. 
I was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Again, I could have won the Academy Award, but the reality of my condition, I couldn't deny. And the Messiah said, hey, you and me, eye to eye. I'm not concerned about what people may think about you. I look at the heart. And the word of God says our prayer should be, God, search my heart and know me. Point out any iniquity in me. So I began to learn about the process of sanctification before I even had the language for it. And I began to hear the still small voice of God and obey it. Even before anyone said, this is what you should do. You see, a heart captivated by a love so great, it it becomes the object of your affection. And if you will allow Jesus to be the greatest object of your affection, what does the uh, the word say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. When we say yes to all, and no idol takes a seat before our God, we welcome him into every pocket, every space, every shadow, every environment. And Galatians 5.25 says, as we live by the Spirit, we begin to stay in step with the Spirit. And so our journey doesn't become a journey of triggers and, and trauma and unforgiveness we hold on to and stress. It becomes a journey of day in and day out choosing to abide. And this is good. This is a good thing because the very work of the Holy Spirit in our lives in accordance with 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So 1 Thessalonians 5.23, oh, give me better ink than this. Let's see. I just want to make sure everyone even in the back can see what we're sketching up here. That one's not it. Maybe the first was my best bet. So at many points in the scripture, but in 1 Thessalonians specifically, right here. It gives us understanding that you and I, each individual, individually, as image-bearing creations of God, are dynamic creatures. We are spirit, soul, and body. What I talked to you guys about earlier was at creation, God was spirit. And when he spoke, the natural came into creation, right? The scripture says that um, even in Genesis 2-7, God formed Adam from the dust, the natural thing, this flesh and blood, you and I, But until God breathed the breath of life into Adam, he was not yet a living being. So until God imparted spirit into Adam, he was just flesh. He was just dust of the earth. Ecclesiastes supports this. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. It says, And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And so you and I are a spirit. Praise God, this is not our forever condition. We're going to be perfected. It's going to be great. But as for now, 
We are a spiritual being that when life was conceived in our mother's womb began to form our very natural body, we're in a natural world, right? And so when you live in a natural world, before you are in Christ, or when maybe you have knowledge of God, but you are living as you please, whatever it may be, the adversary's desire, the enemy's desire, is that as we live as this multifaceted creation, God's so creative, because here, I'll just explain this a little further, the soul... is what really encompasses what we may say when we say the heart of man, the mind, the will, and the emotions. So this is your natural flesh and blood, the flesh, the natural world. This is your inner spirit as the word of God speaks to. And then as the word of God speaks to, your soul, which really holds together what we know is our mind, our will, our emotions. We're complicated creatures. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When we are in the kingdom of darkness the way that the enemy desires we think and operate, essentially when we're born into iniquity, when we're just the the human condition from the jump. He desires that we process life this way. That what happens to us in the natural informs and shapes our mind, our will, impacts our emotions, forms us, that our lives are informed by our natural circumstance, right? As a result, then, so it breaks down kind of three ways. Let me write these out just so we can see. I never spell this right. Someone, I before E, except after C. How do you spell receive? It's not... It's not a unanimous decision. (laughs) R-E-C-I before E, except E-I-V-E. It just doesn't look right, though. Anyone? Okay. (laughs) Receive, process, and express. The enemy desires that we receive information in the natural that our soul seeks to process it as it can, and that it expresses itself into our spiritual understanding. So I'm going to give you an example. When my dad committed suicide, my natural life, I had the wound of my natural father putting a gun to his heart and pulling the trigger. When that occurred in my life, It deeply wounded my emotions, first and foremost. My soul, it didn't even know what to process. It didn't even know how to process. And so my emotions were deeply wounded. My mind was also very overwhelmed, very confused. And my will, the decisions I made going forward, were affected. So the impact point happened in the natural My soul sought to process it and was very wounded. And so my spirit, my inner spirit, then received that information. You couldn't have told me God was a good God. If you tried to talk to me about a heavenly father, I would have shut down. What happens is our little spirit man is in the fetal position. Because we are living life Informed by the natural, our soul is being wounded and hurt and confused in the process. And as we process that, our spiritual grasp, our spiritual understanding, it is impacted and informed by everything in the natural. 
So when I would be sexually involved with somebody in the natural, first off, I just got a nice little tie to that person here. Not so great. That sin point that brought connection there impacted me in the natural and began to affect my mind, will, and emotions. So I may think, no, I'm good. I don't need him. It's fine. And I get a 2 a.m. text. You better believe my will responded. Okay, I'll go do that thing. My mind, no, I, I believe I'm, I'm a strong, independent woman. I don't need, couldn't stop thinking about it. My emotions feel obvious. And therefore, when this union was made, it's why God says, well, man can't join himself to prostitute. There's no, what union is there between the clean and the unclean? When there was a yoking by sexual contact, there was effect here. And when this ultimately was unhealthy and ended up leaving more wounds and he left, you better believe I thought that I needed to perform for God in order for his love to stay that he was going to leave, that if I wasn't enough, that I, if I wasn't, didn't do enough for him, that if I wasn't desirous enough, God wouldn't love me. And so the enemy desires that we receive, process, and express things this way so that whatever he wants to carry out in the natural by way of trauma through others, by way of our own sin and ungodly yokings to other people, by way of the sin that opens the door wide through pornography and things can just flood into the mind, the eye that is the lamp into the body, into the ears. We get triggered by physical things. The enemy says, let me do everything I can to this person because they think this life, this body, this is it. So they become enslaved to the urges of their flesh because they think that's their master. They respond to the triggers. They respond to the whims, the wants. And their, the natural life processes through the soul and leaves us very hurt, very confused, very unwell. And it moves to the spirit and we're just dead. You can call yourself a Christian and be dead. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father on that day, many will say to me, did we not prophesy? We perform miracles. We cast demon in your name. To him, I will say, away from me. I never knew you. Because when we live life this way, you can go about all the works of religion. You could study all the books out there. Until you welcome the Spirit of God to bring your spirit to life, the trauma of the world will continue to inform your spiritual condition and you will be unwell. Now, we're going to take a turn. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He recognized the wages of sin was death. He recognized the kingdom of darkness carrying out its work. The, the invitation of sin is to autonomy and freedom. The reality is as soon as we take the bait, we get trafficked into the brothel, enslaved to sin. I use these terms because God used them with me because my wounds were sexual and I, it all made sense. Unclean spirits... Some people are sick because the enemy's had an open door to afflict you physically. Some people, your mind is tormented. Your obedience and your will is all over the place. You'll give a yes to anyone who makes any request of you. You have no discernment of your yeses and nos because your will is wounded. Your emotions, a mess. Unforgiveness, pain. Your spirit, why do you think the word of God says, wake up, arise? 
Our spirit is not as it should be. But God saw that. He knew it. And so enter... It's really my fault. I should have tested these. Enter the very work of Yeshua, the Messiah, of Christ. The work of the cross. This is the gospel. Jesus, who came to do the work, who carried it out to perfection, who gave of his life, was resurrected by the Spirit. Oh my goodness who took the keys of all authority because he was able to defeat every work of darkness, every jurisdiction the adversary had. The demons know his name and they shudder because what happens is that when you receive Christ by faith, you are then filled with the Holy Spirit and you are born again can y'all see this? You are born again, and now life functions in a way that is informed, received, processed, and expressed as God Almighty always intended it to be. Before the enemy came and flipped the ways upside down, removed us from the place of intimacy in the garden, taught us so many wicked things. The cross of Christ restores what was always intended, which above all, first and foremost, is unity and oneness with the Spirit of God. Your spirit comes to life and receives of the Holy Spirit and now communes with the Lord. And so now where you receive when you are alive in Christ is you receive your information from the Spirit of God. That's through the Word, that is through the fellowship, the body. That is through prayer and the hidden place. And the greatest wound many of you will have to navigate through is learning how to navigate the hidden place of intimacy with God because intimacy is how the enemy has wounded you. The hidden place with the Lord is not exploitative. You don't prove yourself. He won't leave you shame you, embarrass you, and depart. He won't use you and abuse you. Above all, the will of God is never going to force itself upon you. Pornography has trained the mind to see a perverse, manufactured, and, and sick image that is fake. Intimacy is safe. We can't be people who operate Oh, I could go off a whole tangent. Someone go read Fully Known. It will really break that down of how our wounds physically inform our relationship spiritually. But when we receive Jesus by faith, we become filled with the Holy Spirit and we begin to know oneness with the Spirit of God. Instead of the natural life informing us, the Spirit of God informs us. We arise and his mercies are new every morning. We pray without ceasing. It says to pray continually. We worship him even when the circumstances in our lives don't look like they're worthy of worship. We, we pursue his heart. We seek out after his will. I want your ways to become my ways, your thoughts to become my thoughts. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Our life is informed by the Spirit. You won't find me, by the grace of God, making a single decision I haven't consulted the Spirit of God on. Everything discerned, because it may be the most enticing offer. I'm going to go have to ask the Holy Spirit about that. You laugh when you see people on stage or, or in moments say, thank you, Holy Spirit, because you don't know that he actually wants to talk to you 24-7 and the good shepherd is always speaking and his sheep know his voice. This is where we receive because in God's way, life is intended to be lived like this. Your spirit receives from the Holy Spirit. As a result, what it is receiving, 
moves forward and begins to heal your mind, will, and emotions. That's why the Word of God speaks to the renewal of the mind. He takes out old mindsets. He delivers us of literally unclean spirits, even people who are in our mind. He begins to heal our will. What did Jesus say in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was yielding himself to completely the pressing moment before the very work of the cross, the words of Jesus was, is there any other way? But your will be done, not my own. The evidence of the Spirit of God at work in your life. Don't think it's butterflies and roses. Jesus did not skip through Gethsemane. He asked his friends to stay awake. They couldn't even hang. He had to fight. He sweat like blood to yield the humanity he was in to the will of the Spirit of God. But that pressing place is where you're going to find breakthrough. When you let the Holy Spirit say, we got this, we're doing this together. I'm not gonna leave you or forsake you. I'm with you now. I'm with you in that moment of temptation. I haven't left you. I'm with you when you're going to that environment. I'm with you as you navigate your, this conversation with your spouse. I'm with you as you lie down and as you rise up. Your will will be healed because you will begin to learn that obedience to God why have we made that so taboo in the church? Obedience is the mark of a spirit-filled believer. Because we know it's a bad word, right? So is holiness somehow. The will is healed as the Holy Spirit ministers. And we begin to obey God. The emotions become healed. Emotions are not bad. They're from the Lord. But emotions being your Lord is a death sentence. Wow, someone write that down. Never said it like that in my life. Someone just give me a slip of paper so I can remember how that came out. Make some type of infographic on Instagram. The Spirit of God, the word of the Lord says, is like a sword. And when the word of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord are our, our place of reception, that sword begins to cut out the things that have wounded our mind, will, or emotions. We get deliverance. We get freedom. Because the blood of Jesus, we begin to realize it's not just a one-time prayer and then la la do, but I'm still totally wild and all over the place. No, that the blood of Jesus applied by the authority of the Spirit makes every demon flee, heals everything, drives out, exposes what is in the darkness, and drives it out. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word. The blood of Jesus breaks word curses and generational curses. The blood of Jesus has all authority to say, y'all, I was remembering just a few minutes ago, there was one time I got the tiniest piece of glass you've ever seen in your life stuck in my toe. I couldn't even see it to get it out with tweezers. That's what took so long. This tiny shard of glass, and yet it was in my toe and it hurt so bad I could not walk. The tiniest thing that has embedded itself so deep, or maybe it's not tiny at all, but you become so calloused over top it, you think you'll never be free of it, the sword of the Spirit is able to cut out. It's five generations in my family that, ba -ba 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 -ba, we've only ever seen divorce, we've only ever seen adultery. What is five generations to the God of all creation? Amen. He can deliver you. The sword of the Spirit, when allowed, 
Again, this is all free will allowance. You're never going to have healthy intimacy in your marriage if one is forcing themselves upon the other. Healthy intimacy is cultivated by a mutual yes. The same is to be said with spiritual intimacy with God. He's right there, but he's not going to override your will. It has to be your faith saying, I agree with you. Okay, let's do the work. As you allow the Holy Spirit to be whom you receive from, it gets processed through your soul. And your soul is healed. Your mind, your will, and emotions renewed, healed. Obedience comes. We're no longer thinking about that person, every decision we have to make. It's like, well, what would they think about it is the first thing that comes to our mind. No, no, no. Our heart cry becomes, Abba, Father, what do you think about it? As the Holy Spirit heals the soul, the expression comes out in the natural. We bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We begin to walk in self-control. We begin to, let's just look at the word of God. But as I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. That's why Satan wants you going that way. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. God's like, no, 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 in my kingdom. And he shoots it right back. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Romans 12, 1 through 3. That was Galatians 5, 16 through 17, by the way. Romans 12, 1 through 3. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What the, the word of God is saying is that when we do things God's way, this is not going to be some hop, skip, and jump. We're in a war. Spiritual warfare is real. The enemy hates losing ground. The ties that were made in sin to people, open doors we flung open from the lusts of the flesh and let all kinds of manners of things in, wounds, trauma, hurts, the way it's whacked us out here, all of these things the enemy enjoys his jurisdiction in. It is not until one is, receives the breath of life by the Spirit of God that they say, okay, time to put on the full armor of God and to walk with the Spirit as He transforms us and sanctifies us completely that our lives would become a physical testament to His glory. The word of God says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Remember Paul says, you say you have faith. I'll show you my faith by my works. I'm not talking working to earn your salvation. I'm talking about the intimacy here. If it's genuine and authentic, if he's the object of your, of your affection, if he's the one you are pursuing wholeheartedly, will manifest itself in the natural so sweaty. Everything's sweating. <laughs> and then your light will shine before men and they'll give glory to your Father in heaven. And then our lives begin to testify. And then the transformation. You will be so unashamed to testify when you lived life this way because you'll care that everyone come to life and do things God's way. 
You'll go on rescue mission for the least and the lost and the oppressed. You won't be the one that continues to cycle back in learned helplessness. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom. There is nothing in the spirit realm that is hidden. God sees everything. And so, is this on? There we go. Could y'all hear anything I just said? Okay, praise God. Thank you, Lord. God sees everything in the spirit. But the reality is so does the adversary. The word of God says we're not in a battle of flesh and blood. Spirits, principalities, these are real. The warfare is real. He's roaming around looking for any spot, any space, any open door, any connection point that you haven't yet allowed the Holy Spirit to heal. But the work of God and the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus as we agree with him is that he will complete the work that he began. That's what the word of God says. And his blood is sufficient to sanctify us completely, body, soul, and spirit, to cover every element of who we are. We plead the blood when the spiritual warfare is intense. We plead the blood when we recognize our mind and our will are are needing healing and transformation. We plead the blood as we head out each day into the natural world as our choices in our flesh are set before us. His work is to heal all of this completely. And many times we get a lot of lectures or lessons or teachings. They're so good. They're so powerful. I'm not discounting them. But they speak to the mind, to the healing of the will and the emotions, and to the body. All of that is good, but the word of God said the spirit apart from the body is dead. If you want to know deliverance and to walk in the boldness of the Spirit of God and for His grace to so indwell in you that you begin to take every thought captive and surrender it to Christ, that your eyes become opened, that the lusts of the flesh don't own you, you must be born again. Nicodemus was like, what do you mean? How are we going to crawl back in our mom's womb? That's because Nicodemus only understood things in the natural. So when Jesus was speaking spiritual principles to him of revelation, Nicodemus was like, how's that possible? Jesus was speaking of your spirit. We must be born again. Born again. We must ask the Holy Spirit to fill and indwell us. Jesus must become the object of your affection. The heart of God must become what you long to know. Anything that takes the place of that is an idol that must die in your life. We are not people of idolatry. We are the sons and daughters of God. But if you're trying to find healing and you're only addressing these things and you miss this, you miss this, No, our inheritance because of the work of Calvary and the blood of Jesus shed is the gift. I'll talk about it tomorrow. It's called the Matan, the gift before departure that Jesus poured out. It's all about the Hebraic wedding. I'm real excited for tomorrow morning. I don't know about y'all. But before the bridegroom would go to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride, he left a gift before departure. The Hebrew was known as the Matan. What did Jesus say to the disciples? Go hang out in Jerusalem and wait. I have to leave, but it's good that I do because I'm sending you a helper. I'm sending you a gift. And the Holy Spirit's job is to teach us, to convict us, to counsel us, to comfort us, to remind us of everything Jesus taught. That's an everyday, all day engagement. I need to know when I get an urge and I just want to sit down at the computer and navigate to a familiar site. I need to be reminded of what Jesus taught. I want to know that when I'm disrespectful or dishonoring to my husband, I need to be convicted. I 
need to know when I'm holding on to unforgiveness and it's hardening my heart. Or else I'm the one who suffers ultimately. He'll heal bitterness. He'll heal rage. He'll heal anger. He'll heal betrayal. He'll bring forgiveness. He will bring worship. He'll cause the tongue to speak life and not death. He will transform every element of who you are if you'll let him. And everything will change in your life. And you will look like that new creation you claim to be. Because you've been born again. You're being made well. And you're ready to testify by your life and through your works. Our spiritual condition will always reflect itself in our natural condition. What is your spirit testifying to? Whom do you serve? Oh, well, that made sense. Uh, it is. It was cool to me when I saw the visual. I scratched the surface on the scriptures that support this. It helped me to visually understand because I grew up in the church and it's like spirit and soul were just like interchangeable terms, right? Just whatever mood you felt, that's what you said. I, I don't know. I don't know what I was saying. I didn't realize there was a human spirit and the Holy Spirit and angelic spirits and demonic spirit. There's a whole wild spiritual realm. I didn't know. I just thought these were the terms we used and it's how it was in our worship song. No, no, no. This is the reality of the fullness of who you are. And the Spirit of God wants to sanctify it completely. That we would be a bride made ready. I believe it's 2 Samuel that says that we would be a vessel. That we have cleansed ourselves. Is it 2 Samuel? I won't try to go to it right now. I'll find it for tomorrow. The scripture says that we have cleansed ourselves. That we are a vessel made holy honorable for the master's use, ready for every good work. The scripture doesn't say, it just says what it says. Your agreement in the healing and cleansing process is essential. Your agreement with the spirit of God to be cleansed is so key. And the fear of the Lord and its restoration in you will bring transformation. It's a reverent awe. It's an honor and a respect. Thank you for doing this and doing this. Let my whole life testify that it mattered. He's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask and imagine over your life, over your marriage, over your family, in your process of healing. Let him. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you. I thank you, Abba, that you see us and that you know us. I thank you, Jesus, for the work that you did that paved the way for the Spirit to come. I thank you, Holy Spirit. You are such a gift, a gift that multiplies. I thank you that your work... <laughs> Your primary work is to sanctify us. And as we agree with that, the other works born of the Spirit conceived in the hidden place will begin to make themselves known in our lives. Would we be people whose wills are yielded to yours, God? Whose emotions are healed by you, God? whose minds are renewed by you, whose hearts are transformed, our hearts of stone removed and a heart of flesh put in, Lord, that thrives. Let us guard it for it's the wellspring of life, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring healing and restoration. And Lord, I pray that we would be people who, who function in the flow that you desire and are not held captive by the flow of the adversary, 
where every urge must be responded to as our flesh sees fit, where every thought is entertained, where every bit of bitterness still holds ground or unforgiveness remains. No, God, I pray that you, your grace would move, that people would receive more of you, a fresh indwelling, a fresh impartation. Thank you, Adonai. I see the vessels the widow was told to bring together. Bring together the vessels. And as she did, they were filled, filled, filled to overflow with oil. God, I pray even as these vessels have come together, have made the effort to receive from you, God, that you would fill them, Holy Spirit, with oil, Father. That they would not be like the five foolish bridesmaids who don't bring enough oil to keep the lamps burning as you, as the bridegroom, are delayed, Father. But they would be like the wise. The wise who know that even now is the time of pressing in Gethsemane literally means the olive press. Lord, in our Gethsemane, in each moment of our lives that bring us into the place of pressing, of pressing, of pressing. God, we would be like the wise ones who yield our will to yours, who do things your way, who have the oil pressed out that we might be filled to overflow. God, that we might be a blessing that we might be able to not only love you with all, but actually love our neighbor as ourself, actually love our spouse as ourself, actually love those in our lives in a healthy, healed, and restored way because our spirit man is alive and the Holy Spirit calls the shots and we know oneness with you that changes everything. Holy Spirit, come like fire. Come with your healing, anointing balm and fill these vessels to overflow. Sanctify us completely in accordance with your word. Spirit, soul, and body. That we might know spiritual life and life abundant. In Jesus' name, amen.